Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm just going to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name's Ada Malot. Uh, I'm from Wargaming Sydney's office, and I'm a product manager. And over the past 12 months, I've really been focusing on building rapid prototypes on the World of Tanks brand. Um, before joining uh, Wargaming, I worked for Halfbrick uh, for seven years and was sort of working on games like Fruit Ninja. So I've been in the industry for over 10 years, and I think of that 10 years, I've probably spent three years just doing prototyping. And I actually find it really rewarding and fulfilling. It's quite stressful, and there's a lot always going on, but I really find that the sense of discovery and the challenges you have to overcome are really rewarding. And I want to share with you the lessons I've learned on how to make it successful and especially over this last 12 months. So for today, I want to share a journey, which is the journey we took building our first prototype on World of Tanks. I want to give you some lessons that we learned and offer some advice on what you can do next time you need to build a prototype. So what I think is one of the most important things when building a prototype is you really need to put yourself in the right mindset. So, I was really trying to look at what my mindset was. So I was looking for being resourceful. Uh, it had to be really action oriented. You need to be always doing something so you had something to test. Being optimistic is really critical because if you're optimistic, you're able to start looking at, uh, looking at ways of viewing the problem that you wouldn't normally do. You wouldn't be saying, well, no, this can't happen. This can't work. You have to be optimistic. And in general, you're trying to find very unconventional ways of solving the problem. You don't want to be solving it in the same way anyone else has done. That's why you're prototyping. So as I was going through searching for this stuff, I sort of came across an image. Uh, and so this is MacGyver. So MacGyver, he's a 1980s sitcom. He's an action hero secret agent. The main thing that's different about MacGyver compared to most other action heroes, he was trained as, an, as, a, he was trained as a scientist at university. So generally, when he was solving problems, he wasn't going around trying to shoot things and all that. He was taking paper clips and ballpoint pens, building little devices to solve his problems. So you might sort of be wondering, what does a 1980s sitcom have to do with prototyping? Well, it's really about how he went and solved his problems. So the first thing is he always assesses the situation. So he knows what has to be done. He then is also able to look at what he's got to use, what's around him, and then what are currently limiting him? Is he time-based? Does he have to get out in a certain period of time? The next thing that's really important is he goes straight into action. He takes his paper clip and ballpoint pen and starts building something straight away and then tests it instantly. Has to be there to work. The other two aspects that I think are really important in this, he's always optimistic. No problem is too hard to solve. So he's always looking at the potential and what he has around him and what he can use. But in saying that as well, he also knows when to just drop everything and run, when the problems become insurmountable. And these are really key. So I think when I look at this, and I was looking at my mindset for how I approach prototyping, and rapid prototyping especially, I look at what would MacGyver do in these situations. So if presented with a problem, and to me this means that you look for the minimal amount of effort to test something to see if it solves your problem, and then work from there. And a really key aspect to this is knowing when to cut corners, so you can take those shortcuts, and knowing when you can't, because it's going to bite you later on. So. Now that I've sort of said how I approach the problem and what my mindset is, what I'm going to go through now is the journey we took when building one of our first prototypes on World of Tanks. So let's look at the beginning of the prototype. First thing was we needed to get agreement on what the goal we were trying to achieve. So with this particular prototype, we put a pitch together at the end of last year, sent it off to our stakeholders. We thought, yep, this is great. New year, we'll start on this. Get a nice email back. Yeah, no, that's not what we were talking about at all. So we're having to do calls over Christmas, get alignment. Eventually, we were able to get alignment on what we were building as a prototype. But if we didn't do that, we would have been building the wrong thing and would have started really badly. So another aspect here is not only talking about the goals, but really focusing on your hypothesis. So 
you're going to have what you're intending to build, but also getting an understanding of what your current thoughts are and what the stakeholders' current thoughts are for building this uh, prototype. So it's really key to make sure everyone agrees and has a clear understanding about what you're building. So the next aspect we have to do is we have to find a team. So the team that we chose for this prototype had just sort of finished up their previous project. Uh, in Sydney, we're a very technology-focused studio. Uh, we built Big World, which is the engine behind World of Tanks and all the Wargaming's games. So the team we actually picked was a tools team who, who had just finished their project. So they had knowledge of the tech stack. They knew how these games were built and had very intimate understanding about how they can take shortcuts and what the tech can do. But because we're a tech studio, we had a very limited gameplay experience. We had some. Some developers in that team had done AAA development before. But in general, it was a team of very technically oriented pe people. So right now, our project's off to a great start. We'd already done the wrong pitch, and we have a team with no gameplay experience. But I really want to call out that the team really stepped up to this challenge. And it's not because they had any special skills or anything like that. They just had the right mindset and the right attitude to approach the prototype. So now we've got our team. We need to work out how we're going to succeed at this prototype. So we've got our goal. We've got our hypothesis. How are we measuring it? For our prototype, we knew that it was going to be reviewed by executives. So after that, and the executives were happy with it, it was going to be played by tanks players in UX labs. So from this, we had some automatic things that we knew. Everyone who was going to pass judgment or give us advice on this knew tanks. They knew it in and out. They knew how the mechanics work. They knew all the little intricacies of it. They probably had their favorite tank, which meant that we can make some very early calls. So let's not change the UI. Let's not worry about that, because that's only going to make someone uncomfortable. It means they're going to be annoyed, and they'll be able to pick it very early. Uh, another aspect of this is whenever we're trying to add something new to the game, we want to make sure we match the style that's there, or else players are going to be able to easily identify that it's not there, like it's not, it's not part of the game, and it's going to distract them. And this is one of the big things about working on an existing brand as well, is that because people already have preconceptions about the brand, whenever you change something or make something different, they're going to notice it straight away. But you also have the benefit of you already have working builds, and you have this art that you can already access because it's there. So right now, we understood who was going to be viewing it. And we also knew that because it was going to be played in UX labs, that people are going to be fairly close together and able to communicate with each other. So we knew how it was going to be reviewed as well. So the next aspect we, need, aspect we needed to know was, what are the limits of this prototype? In general, you have two types of limits. You either have a time-based limit in the fact that you only have a certain amount of time to find the answer, or a budget-based limit. And they're very similar in the idea that you can only spend so much money. There is a third that is very rare, which is just keep going until you find the answer. Uh, sometimes if you're looking into new markets or really uh, exploring something, you can have those. Um, but I haven't put it down because it is generally not it. For us, we had two months to find the answer. So the way we set ourselves up was we built a pro our process was around two weeks. Every two weeks, we were going to deliver to our stakeholder a working build. They'd be able to see features that had been developed, and we guaranteed that anything that we said was working would be working in that build. So at the start of the two weeks, we would plan, we'd talk about what features and what the priority of getting things into the builds were. We'd build it, and then we'd give it to our stakeholder, and we'd test it together to be able to review and see what we want to do next. So we started off, we came up with our plan. Our first plan was we wanted to have something playable. For our prototypes, always this is what I approach the first plan as. You want to have something that indicates close to where you're going as something you can at least play. And this really led us to our first win. So we were able to hit our first iteration, some really basic controls, and we had a working build. So Let's look at why this was such a success. Now, the reasons for it is we'd now proven that we had the infrastructure set up to actually deliver builds. In the event that you don't have that and you can't deliver it at the end of your first iteration, then you really need to invest more into this. 
And the other aspect of that is because we're able to deliver a build, our stakeholder had really started to build confidence that we're actually going to be able to achieve this. Remember the start I said for this one as well. We pitched the wrong pitch, and we had a team without gameplay experience. So this now all of a sudden meant, yes, I've got a build. I can see it. These guys are actually going to be able to deliver for us. Next, and probably the most important aspect, feedback can start. So our stakeholder was able to play the build, and even on those really early features that we'd built, start giving feedback to us. So it could be, I really like this thing. We should do a little bit more with it. Or, no, this is too close. We need to, to move it back. So you're actually really able to start that feedback conversation really early on. And the other aspect that's really important here is the stakeholder now has something. They can actually start selling it on. They can start showing other people what they've got, which really starts engaging them in the product. Because it's like, oh, I showed it to so-and-so, and they thought it was great and had this idea that we should talk about. So all of a sudden, they're starting to sell the product as well and getting feedback on it. So that's why this first iteration, once we sort of built it once, uh, built our first one and we were able to deliver it, we had such a success. Which leads me to the first lesson, which is if you regularly deliver builds uh, of your prototype, it builds confidence in your stakeholder. So your stakeholder is able to start having much more confidence that you're going to be able to successfully deliver this. You're going to be able to give the next build. And by constantly delivering it as well, and we was, as I was saying for us, we were saying every two weeks you're going to have a new one, that means that they know, OK, if a feature misses this week, it's going to be in two weeks I'm going to see it again. I know it's going to be there because we've discussed it, and I know you keep delivering well every two weeks. So we had our first iteration. We've had our first win, and we were able to deliver a working build. wasn't the actual full prototype yet, but it was the first little part of it. What we really need to work on to now was building an environment for creating ideas. So as I was saying, the team that we were using was a tools team. So they, didn't, they weren't used to trying to come up with new ideas and weren't used to rapid prototyping where you need to be able to iterate really quickly. So we needed to start building an environment for them to be able to start engaging with this. So some of the first things we did early on, we ended up having a physical board which showed all our backlog. It was just on a wall next to the team's area. And what that meant was that at any point in time, anyone on the team could see the work that needed to be done for the project. But it was done with post-it notes. So if anyone had an idea, all it took was getting a post-it note, writing your idea, stick it on the wall. We had five columns on our, our Kanban board that was on the wall. So we had the idea area where anyone could throw an idea up. The next area was the backlog. So this was. I'd talk to the person who put the idea up. We said this was a good idea, that we should do this, and we prioritize it with every other feature. After this, we had to do in progress done. And then every two weeks, we'd go through, we'd take all the done tickets off the board, shift them to the side, and start again. Now, this had some really big benefits and, and started to generate these ideas. But one of the biggest benefits was the discussions and the collaborations that started happening around this board. So we'd take someone would go put an idea up, someone else would see them put the idea up, go over, look instantly at it, and then they'd start a discussion and already start refining that idea and start talking about, it. oh, this would be good or that would be good. So what I found early on, because we were really trying to get people to collaborate, to really want to start sharing ideas, this was one of our, our early successes to start really generating that environment where people would start collaborating. Which also led to, yeah, which also led to the second lesson. Now, when we had this board up, a lot of our first ideas were just about speeding up iteration. We just wanted to work faster. And when you're rapid prototyping, you know, you know that that code is never going to go to production. And it's not meant to. You're prototyping. So you can cut corners and do things that would not work in a production instance. A great example of this is that we added a feature that would reload all scripts when you hit F9. Could never do this when you release it to a player. That would just cause you nightmares and, and badness. But what it did for us 
what would, would have taken a game restart, log into a server, because we're building off the existing IP of World of Tanks here. So you have to log in, start a match to test something out, find out you set the wrong number, do it again, just became a half a second. F9, is it working? No, change, F9. And then it became behaviors and things like that. We could test anything out. And it was just really quick and iterative. All of a sudden, we found, once we had this in, people started generating more ideas. And I was trying to look into this and what happened. And a really big part of it was, there was this little idea in people's heads where it's like, I've got this great idea. But as a developer, I know how hard it is to implement. Which means, straight away, I'm, I'm just not going to raise it to anyone. Because I know if I had to implement it, it's going to take me a week, and I don't really want to spend a week on it, and I'd work on something else. All of a sudden, we'd sped up the iteration. And they were like, oh, now that it's going to be so much easier, and I don't have to spend a week just restarting the game to try something, oh, yeah, you should do this. And it's like, yes, we should have done that. So to, re to me, the real thing here is once you start speeding up the iteration, you actually get much better engagement from your developers and the team that's doing the prototype. And really, prototyping is about making sure that you test as many ideas as you possibly can so that you can find the best one, you can find the gems. And quite often, that's not going to be the first thing you think of. You'll actually have to discover it. It also makes the team feel really valued because you're valuing their time and their investment by giving them the tools to succeed. So that was lesson two. So another aspect that we did, we did a lot of playtesting. So we did playtesting twice a week, every week. It was always at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday and Thursday. Again, like delivering consistently, we made it our playtests were consistent. The only time we would ever delay them was if a key feature was only like 15 minutes away. Because we'd set ourselves up to iterate, we were able to get builds done quickly as well. So waiting 15 minutes wasn't a problem. Now, when you're playtesting, what you really need to do is be critical. And what I mean by this is, you may have built a feature, but if you don't like it, you really need to call it out. Because if you don't like it, there's a chance someone else doesn't like it. And maybe they're not speaking up. Maybe they're worried about hurting your feelings. But at the same time, that person should have spoken up as well. So you do need to be critical and think about it from the player's experience. You need to look at the features that are working and the ones that aren't and call them out. So you, you start up and go, yep, I really like this feature. And you should feel good about that. You've actually prototyped something, and it worked. And the same time, you should do the reverse. It's like, we built this feature. It's just not working. Should we iterate, or should we drop it? Another aspect here is we really did a design by feel. Now, design by feel is sort of very unusual. In general, when you're designing, you come up with this idea at the start, and it's like, yep, yeah, it's perfect. We're going to work on it, and it's going to be like this. With rapid prototyping, I think the most important thing is to build something to start with. Spend less time overanalyzing the problem and just build one thing. Which leads me to lesson three. Be in action, and testing enables idea exploration without overinvestment. So the best example I have with this is I was at Halfbrick. And I was in a meeting. We just had a critical change in our process. And we needed to change one of our game modes. I had two designers who were arguing about, oh, it would be better if we did this because of these reasons and, and all these theories. And after about 10 minutes of sitting in this room and realizing what they were talking about, I just got my laptop out and started working. They kept arguing, oh, no, this would be better. It's going to feel better for the player. At one point in time, I just interrupted them and said, I built it. I built one of the solutions. And they said, geez, that feels horrible. I was like, yeah, all right, we're done. Argument over, let's move on. We had our answer. And by just testing one of the two, instead of sitting there discussing the pros and cons of either, we were able to really quickly come up with an answer. So we used our play test to do this. We would just start with the best idea we had at that point in time. Not overanalyzing it too much. We would build it, and then we just test it. And we'd go, this was great, or it's not working. And we just iterate from there. We get learnings. Sometimes you have to throw it away and restart. Other times, you're onto something and can progress it. So our playtest structure was really set up 
We did it in an hour, because we are doing it twice a week. We didn't want to invest too much time. We wanted to make sure we were actually progressing things as well. So we, we spent about an hour every, every Tuesday and Thursday. Our playtests were set up in a very similar structure, in that at the start, there was five minutes. We'd talk about what we're going to test today, what was new, what we wanted people to look out for. We called this the kickoff. And it, it sort of got everyone together, got everyone focused. And it sort of made everyone start feeling like a player. Because all of a sudden, it's not like you're at your development machine, you're just gone from work, that you were testing something, and now you're just testing the game again. It's like, no, take five minutes, let's get in the mindset of a player. You're going to be experiencing this as a player. You're going to go through all the loops, you're going to be actually testing it as a game. So this five minutes was just a, a, a mindset setting, know what to look out for, what we want feedback on at the end. Next, we'd been we play test for about 45 minutes, just go through, test everything out, people rotating through, trying different aspects of the prototypes and all that. After this point in time, we just call, yep, stop time now. We're going to take 10 minutes, and we're going to gather what everyone's thoughts. We're going to collect that input. We're going to really look at everyone's ideas, and we're going to get everyone's ideas. One of the things I made sure we did is when we're actually doing this retrospective, actually ask everyone and make sure everyone at least raised one point of something they liked from what had been built or something that wasn't working for them. From that, we generate action items, post-it notes, wall. Meant that we were able to action really quickly and just have it built into our flow. So when I was talking about our two-week process before where we plan, built, and test, our features ended up looking much more like this. We'd plan, build, test, do a play test. And from that, we'd get new actions, new changes. So we'd plan, build, test. And in this, we're trying to look at different features and all that. So we might finish a feature after the second iteration. We're happy with it. We found an answer. We want to give it to our stakeholders. Start the next feature and all that. But it was really just this constant iteration and just making sure we're testing, but testing from the player's perspective, not just testing it that it works, but actually playing with it before we'd actually say it's done. Which led us to actually the fourth lesson that we learned. And this is, you need to think about how your prototype is going to be experienced. This really enhances the player's experience of it. So because every time we did a play test, we had to go through what our end user was going to have to do. We're going to start from scratch. You're going to have to log in. You're going to have to go into a battle of this type and do this. And what it meant was that we're actually reviewing the game, not from, hey, does feature A work or feature B work, but we're reviewing it from how they're going to experience, how they're going to see it. What's the first thing they're going to see from the prototype? Is it just too hard to get into? In one of them, we have to set up a, a description in the room to say, hey, we're doing this type of prototype now. And I remember getting a message at like midnight in Australian time, because obviously we're in terrible time zones, uh, saying, hey, is this actually working? I'm like, well, you should know. It was a very big change to the game. And I was like, did you do this? No. Well, yes, it's not working then. So you really need to look at how someone's going to be able to test your game and, and the experience they're going to have. And you want to streamline that as much as possible so they're going to be able to see it and give you feedback on the actual prototype rather than how hard it was to get to the prototype. So from this, we'd built an environment for ideas. So what were some of the benefits we were immediately starting to see? The team started having much more energy because they felt heard. They could raise their ideas. They could, from our play test, we could action things straight away. And the team started to feel a bit of investment in the product because they were actually able to make changes in it. We were able to start collaborating on the product with other people within the studio, within our team. We were able to make those changes. And because when these changes were coming through, people were actually able to start driving those changes as well. So it's like someone comes up with an idea from one of the play tests, sticks it on the wall, but then they actually start implementing and working on it. And they could drive the direction of that idea through the delivery to the stakeholders. The last aspect that this process really made for us was we always had a working build. We were testing this twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, which meant at most a build could be broken for one day. 
or else you are wasting everyone's time. So because of this, we really focused on always having a working build and always someone playing it. And these were some of the benefits we were getting from generating this environment for ideas. But we still had a stakeholder relationship where during our planning meetings, we were sort of setting a lot of the decisions. So we really need to start focusing on empowering the team to start owning the prototype, really investing in it, and starting to drive the prototype with the stakeholders. We're not trying to exclude them. But we want to make sure the team has the autonomy not to be slowed down by waiting for answers, which for us from Australia is a big problem with a 24-hour turnaround. So the first thing you need to do if you want to start empowering the team to make decisions is you got to talk about problems and not solutions. So you've got to look at why are we trying to make this solution work? And always work back to the problem you're trying to solve. Now, for me, I come from an engineering background. This is really hard. I like solving problems. I've made a career out of solving problems. But if you do that, you rob the team the opportunity to solve it. You've solved it for them. You've done the creative part. They're just implementing it now. This isn't fun for them. You've just created this environment for generating ideas, but only your ideas are heard. So you really need to make sure that you, when you're working with your stakeholders or prototypes and all that in general, that you try work back just what problem are you trying to solve so that then you can empower the team to find the solution for it. Now, a key aspect of this is you need to build alignment. You need to make sure Everyone is facing the same direction, talking the same way, and selling together. And this is really key, because once you build alignment, you're able to start earning trust and autonomy. Which really brings me that fifth lesson, which is when you have alignment, the team has that trust and autonomy. So once you've got the alignment, um, you're able to start making decisions. And your stakeholders will know that you're making the right decision because you're all aligned and they would have made the same decision at the same time. But what happens if you get it wrong? Well, you're delivering a build every two weeks. You're sinking weekly anyway. It's not going to get that far out of hand if you make a wrong call. Because you're all aligned, it's not going to be that far off. And in the event that the wrong call was probably made, then you probably haven't shared enough information. There's also a second side to the alignment, which is not just for the team, it's also for stakeholders and people selling your product onwards in the fact that they're aligned with what features are coming and where the, the product direction is going. They can start talking to people and saying, oh, that's a great idea. We're already thinking about doing this. So it also helps get them alignment and the decisions that they're making are in line with what the team wants to do as well. So you don't have two different people pulling in different directions which is really frustrating. So another aspect to empowering the team was we've generated these great ideas. We put them on a wall. Now we need to start selling these to the stakeholder to say that these are some really, really great ideas that we should be progressing. These are some problems we should be solving because that way we're starting to engage the stakeholders. So. If you're dealing with them, you're dealing with stakeholders, you need to make sure that you're selling the team's ideas. Or even better, if you can, let the team sell their own ideas. We had someone on the team who had a great idea of what we could do in a pre-battle for one of our prototypes. We were like, this is a great idea. What I noticed straight away is that he was super passionate about this idea. And he was going to do a far better job selling it than I ever would. So at our next weekly sync, I sort of said to him, look, you should sell this to the stakeholder. You should tell him why it's so valuable and so cool to do. And it was quite a good success. Now, this did a couple of things. Firstly, it all of a sudden meant the stakeholder had more engagement with the team. He could start seeing that it was, just a t it was actually a team of people who were starting to do different things, not just the people he normally talked with. Secondly, it meant the team felt they could be heard, even at a higher level, for their ideas. 
And from this, we've got to lesson six, which is having a takeaway each delivery makes your stakeholders more engaged. So what this means is every time you deliver a build, you should have something that has changed, but not to the point of just like, hey, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit better. If you didn't say anything to anyone, they should be able to say, this is different. I have played the last build, I'm playing this one now, and I know this changed because it's obvious to see. And this is, I, we used to call it a shiny thing. It, it doesn't, like, it, it might not seem like much, but it's just like that little distraction. It's like, it takes your attention, you know, it's like, yes, this progressed. This makes the team feel very empowered because you're starting to see the build always changing. And stakeholders the same because they can start selling new things. Just one thing to call out here though, if you are starting to find that you're running out of these shiny things to talk about and bring into your builds, that's probably a good indication that you should have a discussion with your stakeholder about what's going on. Are they not as engaged anymore? Uh, is, does a team think the prototype's reached its goal? Or maybe this is just a, co a calling point to say, look, maybe this prototype's not working. But once you start seeing this drop in ideas and engagement, this is a generalization, but once you start seeing it, it's a good point to sort of start saying, what's going on? It's like the canary in the mine. This is an indication that something might be wrong. We need to do some investigation. So we've gone through, we built it. We need to get into our validation phase. Had we achieved our goal? So for us, we were doing it with internally with executives to say, look, is this idea any good? Once we sort of got executive approvals, then we're going to go to players in the UX labs to see what they thought of it. So we did our first round with our executives. They were quite happy with the prototypes, most of them. And we started to go to UX labs. Now, when you go to UX labs, you all of a sudden get people who have not been involved in the prototype in any way, shape, or form. And quite often, your onboarding experience can be overlooked as well. So what's always good is when you do that, make sure you have some form of hand-holding to be able, make sure that you're able to effectively get feedback from your prototypes. At Wargaming, we're really lucky in the fact that we have UX labs. Uh, we have teams that are able to go through, get really good, high-quality feedback from people. But let's say you're a small studio and you don't have access to this. One thing that you can do, and we used to do it at Half Brick, was bus stop testing. The way bus stop testing worked was you put, the build, uh, the, you put a build on a phone, went down to the bus stop that was 100 meters from the office, gave it to someone, let them play it. We were building phone games that we wanted people to play at bus stops. That was the thing to do when Fruit Ninja came out. That's, where people, that's what people had iPhones for, to play on bus stops and to show off at pubs. That's why you had an iPhone. But this was a really simple way because you got really raw and honest feedback quickly because they had no investment in your game. Just, here you go. Would you play this again? No, thanks. <laughs> Next person. <laughs> But yeah, so it was a really quick way of actually being able to get some feedback. So whatever you do, try, find, try to get feedback from someone who's not in your team, not in your company. Invite friends and family around, those types of things, just to get it. Because generally when people have been engaged with your project, they already have some preconceptions about what works, what doesn't. I already know how to get past this. So it's really important to make sure you get that. Another real big thing here is, Feedback is advice. You don't have to do it. If you want to make that one person happy, yes, you have to do it to make that person happy. But you need to ask yourself, do I actually need to do this to make most people happy? Is there a high value in this? Now, again, you need to focus on your target market and who you're aiming for. But that's the key thing here is, what is the value of this advice and assess that based on the time you have remaining or the budget you have remaining in your prototype. Uh, is this going to progress you towards your goal more than something else? Which led us to lesson seven, which is when you can actually show someone the build, right? This is not just your opportunity to get feedback on the build. It's actually an opportunity to get feedback on your pitch as well, your product vision, your product strategy. So it, every time you show it to someone, it is the full spectrum. You get to be able to say, here is the pitch, here's the spiel, here's the build. Did this all align? Did you 
understand this. What did you engage with? So when you think of prototyping and your UX testing, make sure you're not just thinking about the product and the build itself, but you're also thinking about how you can also refine your product vision and your product strategy. So this leads us to the last one, which is be ready for anything. This is probably the thing I learned the most from my prototyping. When we sent one of our very, very early builds, it was there, uh, half our features weren't working at that point in time, and we found out from our stakeholder one day, Victor Kisley, the CEO's, come in and play the build. We're like, well, this wasn't meant to happen for a couple of weeks. It's like, oh no, yeah, it was fine, he was happy, it was good, it's like, wow. Had no idea that this was gonna be there. Luckily, we always had working builds and that we were delivering constantly that we were able to have that success, but it was a bit of a shock. After we sort of got to the end of the prototype, they were starting to show some of these prototypes to third-party studios. And at one point, I was going to Chicago because we were doing some work with them, and we got to the point where I landed in San Francisco and I had all these Skype messages. The bill's not working, what's going on? So in my three hour layover in San Francisco, I'm logging in, trying to debug what the problem was. We're able to identify it, put the fix off with about 45 minutes left till I have to board my next flight. So be ready for anything to go wrong because chances are if you're building a prototype, it will go wrong. So I'm just going to go through in a summary now of those lessons, those key lessons that we learned while building prototypes. So first one, make sure you deliver constantly. Deliver regularly, and the earlier you can deliver, the better it is. Just make sure you hit that constant rhythm so that your stakeholders and people know when they're expecting the next build and when the next features are going to be there. Iteration is key. Make sure that you're able to Use your developers effectively. They're your most valuable asset and resource that you can contribute towards this prototype. You need them to be engaged. You need them to be set up for success, which means you need to enable them to iterate fast. Be in action. And by being able to test things constantly, you're able to explore ideas without over-investing. So just build your best idea now, see what it's like, and then from there, iterate rather than spending all your time over-designing and never building anything. Think about how your prototype's gonna be experienced. So don't just think of it as, oh yeah, we're just building these features. Go the whole loop. How does someone get to it? How is someone gonna see it? How does someone understand it? How does someone know if it's working? So make sure you understand how your prototype's gonna be experienced. Make sure you align on your goals at the start. So, like we did, we had it wrong. We would have spent time building the wrong thing. Make sure whenever you're doing anything, you're aligning on where you're going next. One, so you actually know where you're meant to be. Two, so that everyone's talking the same thing. Six, make sure you have a key takeaway every delivery. Make sure that someone who played your last build and is now playing this build could say, that was different. I noticed this because that's what you're gonna get feedback on, and if not, people will start going, ah, this is becoming stagnant. I don't really wanna play it anymore. So this really keeps people engaged. They can go, oh, that was different. That was interesting. And lesson seven is show, whenever you show your build to someone, this is your opportunity to also test your selling, test your pitching, because you don't get a lot of opportunities for this, but it also means that you can test how your pitch matches the product as well. And the last real thing I want to say for if you want to actually get prototyping done and really effectively is prototyping success, I believe, is really hinged on how engaged your team is with the prototyping process. They don't need to be engaged with the actual prototype. That helps, obviously, but what you really want is the team to be engaged with the prototyping process making sure they're going through, testing things, building things quickly, iterating. Because if you have that, you'll make sure you test out more ideas and you're using your people and your teams the most effectively as you can, which will make sure you get closer and better successes. And in general, what I've found is everyone has a lot more fun prototyping and a lot less stress. So I just wanna thank you all for listening and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Aidan. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. We have two microphones. Uh, hello. Uh, how about uh, second chance for rejected idea? And uh, second, um, how about idea from community, from forum, from mod, from? Yep. So uh, in regards to the idea of how do you get second chances for ideas? So in general, the way I look at prototyping is you don't really have failures. You only have learnings. And a key reason for this is that at the start of development of that idea, everyone agreed it was a good idea. No one said, look, I don't think this will work, or we shouldn't do this, these other ones are more important. You all agreed as a team, as a group, that this was worth doing. Now, you get to the end of that and you can go, look, this isn't working. It's going to maybe take too long, too much more investment. There could be a lot of reasons that you choose not to invest into it more. But you might find after doing some other tests or other experiments that all of a sudden this idea isn't as hard anymore. Or now that we've solved these other problems, this can come out and be more effective. In general, you've got to use your time or your budget effectively to answer the question the best you can. So I generally find that it's rare for you to say, no, this idea is, is dead to me. I'm never going to look at it again. It was just bad. In general, it's, it's a learning that you might apply later when the situation changes. Uh, in regards to sort of looking at communities and all that, when you're prototyping internally on your own product, you, while you might get inspiration from the communities, you're generally not going to be using them to get feedback from unless they become in the UX lab tests. And because of that, you don't generally will have that feedback and it'll provide inspiration. And again, like I was saying, communities are probably giving you answers, not their problems. So you're going to have to work back to what their problem was to effectively try come up with solutions. And it might not be theirs. So yeah, does that answer your question? Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, hello, and thanks for the very interesting lecture. Uh, I have a quick question regarding your bus stop testing. Uh, well, or equivalent in the, uh, whether you performed an equivalent uh, in the World of Tanks experiments. Like if you, for example, tried to drag in <laughs> Uh, into the testing some team from other office not related to the team or even just people from your office not not involved directly in the development? Yep. So, yes, we did uh, a lot of that. So, uh, within the studio of Sydney, we work with lots of projects and lots of different games. Um, and because of that, it actually means that people within the studio are actually quite good. They might not have a lot of visibility on the project, which means that they get very fresh eyes. Um, we have a very open plan office, which actually means uh, we set our playtests up to be in the middle of our areas as well. So in general, when you have a bunch of people sitting around, playing a game, calling out to each other, or because you're prototyping, yelling at the game, right? we had a lot of that. That was, that was actually one of our benchmarks for if a feature was working. If, if people weren't yelling out or saying, damn, what's going on? We've, we've actually probably hit a point where it's working now. Um, but when this starts happening around the office, all of a sudden people just start naturally crowding around to see what happens. Oh, why is everyone yelling out over here? Uh, or if you have a whole bunch of people standing around at the start of a playtest, you generally get a few people who are just like, why is everyone standing around here? What's going on? Um, but yeah, so we then do that. You can get other people engaged. And when you actually want to do a structured test, you can say, hey, look, we want, we generally target a team. It's like, hey, can this team come test this out for us? But we're also working with the Cyprus office as well, and they were organizing playtests within Cyprus and other studios around, uh, as it was much harder for us in Sydney. Uh, we'd set up some test servers in Europe, so we're able to quite easily be able to get any studio to connect effectively. So we did lots of testing uh, with lots of people. Uh, what's your point on uh, balancing between fast prototyping and keeping vast amounts of, of documentation? Uh, so was the question for this one, what's the... Uh, what's the, your point on balancing between fast prototyping and keeping vast amounts of documentation yeah. on your prototype? So for anyone who knows me, my writing skills are horrible. So 
um, all up, so documentation is important, uh, but in prototyping, I focus documentation on uh, how to set up a build, how to make things work and run, and we use a backlog to really define where our ideas are and what our thinking is. Yeah, you've got what's being done and things like that, so you can be able to review the backlog for where your ideas were, and then what's coming up. As you get to the end of a prototype, I believe things change. You've already got some of your answers, and at this point in time, you start writing more documentation. The reason I don't invest and don't encourage investment in documentation early in rapid prototyping especially, is by the time the document is written, it's probably out of date. Because as I was saying with the two designers who are arguing, by the time someone's written up a document, an engineer's probably started it, found a problem, and already changed it in some way, shape, or form. So I would try to keep it very task-based, and our documentation really for our prototypes was that board, that wall we had that had all the information of the project on it, and then it was just build setup and deployment that we were more storing as actual documentation. That's just for rapid prototyping. Once you progress past that, documentation is much more important. Yeah, my follow-up question. Um, I'm sure you, your, some of your devs demand um, quite um, enough documentation for them to start working on the feature. How do you work with them uh, in terms of documentation? Um, so the key aspect for us was that we really focused on defining a problem, right? Anyone can have a solution to a problem. And we wanted to really focus on that collaboration. So um, for the rapid prototypes at the start of the year, I was doing design. So when someone wanted to start a new thing, they'd just come talk to me. We'd have a quick discussion about what this was meant to do. And they'd just start working on it. We, all, we, all, we had an alignment between us on what the goal was. And I trusted them to achieve that goal. And what's the worst that was going to happen? In two days, we'd test something. It's not right. We'd iterate with feedback from the team. So we had, and that happened, right? There was times when someone would take a task off the board, start working on it, great. No, that was totally not what we were aiming for. OK, we've lost two days, in, or one day generally, in development before we tested it. OK, let's change and, and replan. So while, yes, it can have some negatives, in general, the fact that the team becomes more engaged and empowered to make the decisions on the project, they actually become much more effective. And it provided you're communicating the direction you're going and why you're going that way, they'll make the right decision. They'll understand what needs to be done. And just have people talking and collaborating together. So have a, if an engineer's working on it, get them to pull a designer or a QA over to their machine for 10, 15 minutes, talk about where things are at, is it good, and keep going. Uh, hi. Uh, at the end of your speech, you tell us uh, we should prepare. Uh, we should be prepared for everything, and your cool story about uh, fixing bugs in at the airport. Uh, so, how about uh, functional testing? Can you tell us a little bit more of it? Functional testing uh, of prototypes. Uh, so, I would. So, we had QA who were doing uh, functional testing based on the problems we're trying to solve, and it was it was really on our key goal for functional testing was: is the build not broken? Right? That was the key aspect we needed. Now, we were a very close team. We were always communicating and talking. We had the board to be able to explain where projects were at. So our QA really worked closely with our development team to understand, OK, what are you intending this feature to do? All right, I will test that that functionality is being done. At the end of the day, we were play testing twice a week. So our real functional testing was done by the entire team in one hour to go, is this working the way the team expected it to? And I would be involved in those play tests so that if something wasn't working to the specifications we had talked about or we, the problems we were trying to solve, then I would be able to give feedback on it. But in general, I found the team gave just as good feedback as I would and quite often better. So a real aspect here is to make sure that you're just testing it as a player and you'll catch all your bugs. Uh, hi, thanks for sharing your experience. And my question is, uh, if you had a different selection of teams, uh, would you do it again? Would you select the same team for uh, prototyping? I mean, uh, does it 
or did it matter? Uh, so I believe the most important aspect in prototyping is your mindset. And as we took an example here, we took a team that was very tech focused and applied the right mindset and empowered them to be effective and they achieve success. And I think that you can take an amazing gameplay team who can do really great stuff, but if they're so focused on a production mindset and not a prototyping mindset, I think they would be much worse than the team that we use to achieve this. So if I had another choice, I would use the same team again because it worked well. And I've worked with a lot of prototyping teams over the years. Some of them have been amazing. Some of them get behind the idea. I've seen two-man teams that are hyper-effective. I've seen five-man teams that just can't get along, can't get in the mindset, and everything becomes about designing, and it just fails. So for me, it's just purely on, do these people want to solve the problem? Are they invested in iterating? And probably the biggest thing is, are they able to let go of ideas? If something's not working, can they drop it and move on to something else? If you hold on too tight to the idea you have, that's where you'll start failing. OK, thank you. OK, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you for the questions. Thank you.